Hi, we are talking today about 1 Nephi 18 through 19. And after this, in chapter 20, we are starting the Isaiah chapters. So I wanted to share some thoughts on these two chapters before we do the next video. Chapter 18 is um, catching the Lehi family in a better place kind of spiritually from time to time Nephi is instructed to how to work these timbers and I think it's interesting because there's not a lot of places in the Middle East area where there were big timber deposits and so I wonder you know I think the way we liken the scriptures to us is and and we get curious about the scriptures that makes the scriptures come alive so I pose these questions not because you know that that we need to have every answer or that you need to research every fact but I think it helps the book of mormon be alive and so he works this workmanship is called curious and I love that word so what does curious mean unique beautiful careful nice made with care artful elegant finished in particular so I like to think about this in a way of Heavenly Father has patterns that are different maybe than your neighbors for your life. And they're curious, they're different, and they're unique. And Nephi was being taught a very unique, curious workmanship in building these ships. And as he built them, he didn't build them, the scriptures say, after the manner of men, but after of God. I think this is a great scripture to invite your kids and your family to ponder on maybe ways in which God has directed your family to do things differently than maybe another family and that that's okay. That's one of the patterns of the Lord. And we see in this chapter where um, Nephi goes to the Mount oft, and we know what AKA the Mount is, the temple. And he prayed often and there the Lord showed him many great things. And maybe he was preparing him for his journey. Maybe he was getting him ready to be the leader in the promised land. Because we know soon after, Lehi passes away. And the voice of the Lord had come unto Lehi to say it was time to go. And I think that's interesting that Nephi's in charge of the ships. And he's really functioning as a leader here. But Lehi is still the prophet and, and leader of this family. And... They had different assignments, and sometimes we see that where we have church leaders or maybe um, assignments in your family where different responsibilities are, are set about within a family or within an organization, and everyone plays a role. And so Lehi knows from the Lord's direction it's time. And the scriptures in this chapter say they set went down into the ship. And so that may tell us a little bit about the ship. There was obviously something below and maybe something above and the type of ship that it was. And they brought seeds and honey and provisions according to their age. I thought that was really curious. Like according to their age, why was that so important to know? Like, was it the youngest that went in first or was it the oldest that went in first? I don't know. I just found that really curious. If you have any thoughts on that, please make a comment. And then the wind, much like the Jaredites, drive their ship forward. And put, um, and it says they put down into the sea after many days. So what type of ship was it? We know the Jaredite ship was built tight like unto a dish and went under the water, right? So um, was, was this Lehi tribe vessel similar? Um, the journeying gets really challenging. And after some time, the murmuring must begin, right? And what happens sometimes is when we're murmuring and we want to feel better, um, you know, it sounds like there was maybe some drinking and dancing and numbing, right? We do this numbing thing and they were getting really crazy and Nephi was afraid and it was because he was afraid for everyone's safety. He saw what they were choosing to do and that's why he was afraid. I love the story so much because this is where the Lord is showing his love by chastising. And oftentimes we think, well, God is love and he doesn't, you know, he's really loving all the time. And that nature of God is true, right? But he, he ultimately wants his children to be happy. And he knows sometimes that it's the chastening that bring his children back. And so Nephi begins to talk to them with much soberness. And I looked up soberness. It's serious, calm, and coolness. Isn't that interesting that he was talking to them really calmly, very specifically, and they got really angry. They were super defensive. Have you ever had that kind of conversation when someone knows that they're 
wrong and then they're defensive and they are mad at him and treat him horribly. They tie him up and the Liahona stops working. It is so bad that the ship is starting to be driven backwards and they don't even know how to steer it. And for three days, Lehi and Sarah are sick on their beds because of the choices of their kids. Like energetically, spiritually, physically, when we're sad, when we're grieving, when we're worried, it changes how our body functions. And Nephi's wife and children, this is where we hear about his children, are crying unto them. And they're not listening. They're not listening at all. And what is Nephi doing here? This is where he's one of my... This is one of his hero examples for me. He is praising God the whole time. He is swelling up. It's so tight. And he is nevertheless humble. And he's not murmuring. He's not complaining. He's praising God. Do you think he's saying, this is awesome. I love this. I love being tied up. This is awesome. No. But he praised God the whole time. And it was on the fourth day, which made me think of the fourth watch that they finally made the connection that maybe the ship isn't working and and everything's going backwards and they're they're afraid they're going to lose their lives and the Leona's not working oh and it may be duh because of their choices lehi tries to interject before this point and they get angry at him and um I think it's interesting to note that because he praised God, he stayed spiritually minded. And we know this because the minute they untie him, the Leona starts to work. And when they arrive, um, they are, can you imagine how happy? Think about how long this journey has been. They've left Jerusalem at least, it's been at least eight years. And, and then eight years in the wilderness. And then how long is this many days upon the water? How many days or months did it take to reach the promised land? Can you imagine how happy and joyful they were to one, finally get on the boat before they left and then get off the boat. And, and when they arrive, they bring seeds and the land is abundant. There's meat and ore and gold deposits and horses. And this is one of those tidbits that people have tried to use to trip up you know, the Joseph Smith debate that he wrote this. First of all, the time frame by which he wrote this, there's so much information out on the internet about this, how long it took him, how quickly he wrote this. Um, there was a period of time that everyone thought that horses only came over to the American continents um, through the Spanish explorers. Um, but in the last few years that it has been found evidence that there were horses here during that time pre the Spanish. So as we go into chapter 19, there's these precious metals and there's uh, this abundance in this promised land. Can you imagine how happy they were? And Nephi goes about to make the plates. I love this chapter because it talks about the older plates and him receiving the plates and then his first plates and being the large plates where there's all the secular and, and kind of history. And then I've shared this with you before. And then he makes the small plates. And those are his more spiritual experiences. So are you keeping small plates? He talks about his nervousness of, of doing a good job keeping these records and um, worrying that he will err. And as an author, I've had that fear many times. And I'm, I'm here to say to you that your journals and your record keeping don't, don't get hung up on making them perfect, that your posterity will want to see them, to read them and learn from them. This is an interesting chapter because um, it talks about the things of not being trampled underfoot and he suffereth it in a meekness and scourging and, and this is the savior that he was ignored. Zenus and Zenic are um, quoted here, which are all um, stories and prophets that were listed um, the books of Moses on the brass plates. That was their scripture, right? And Isaiah was like their Joseph Smith and their brass plates were their scripture. And here we see these um, mentions of these Old Testament prophets. And he takes from their journals and their teachings too and makes his record. He invites us to hearken and liken these scriptures unto us. And I hope that these videos have been a way in which you can liken scriptures unto you as you're studying them and that you know of my testimony of this book that it is a living, breathing, 
uh, book of scripture that can be your only ahona. Thanks for joining me.